Why does this always seem to happen? Farmers gathering together to swarm the capital, demanding the government give them whatever they want. No, really, it happens all the time, all over the world. Farmers in the Netherlands, Argentina, Indonesia, France, Belgium, Finland, India, Cyprus, France, Serbia, Spain, Germany, and wow, France again are all part of this trend and these are only some of the protests in the last five years alone. These farmers brought scenes of blocked roads filled with tractors, hay bales burning in the city square, and literal poo sprayed all over government buildings to generally protest for higher food prices the result of what we would call protectionist policies. Whether that policy be a special tariff for imported food, limiting the amount of foreign food that can enter the country, a quota, subsidies given to local farms, or a guaranteed minimum price that their food will sell at. Many protest for these even if it ends up costing the average Joe a pretty penny. And you know what? You've gotta hand it to the farmers. They almost always end up winning these protests. Across the world, agriculture is easily the most protected and paid for industry, despite the fact that when food prices are higher, well, you eat food, almost everybody in the country is worse off. So why are there no consumer protests, or at least consumer protests with a specific goal of say, limiting tariffs or ending subsidies on certain food products? There's no mob parading the streets demanding that 76 cents be taken off carrot prices through the abolition of a tariff rate quota. But the reverse? It happens multiple times a year all over the globe. I love farmers as much as the next guy, but seriously, why do they keep doing this? Well, let's start off with one of the most important foods, especially to most people watching this video. Sugar. Americans in particular absolutely love their sugar. They're the world's third largest consumer of it, and on average, Americans consume nearly three times the recommended limit. Whether you like it or not, sugar is very important to the American diet. You can't have a healthy breakfast of Fruit Loops and orange juice without it. And perhaps because of its belovedness, sugar is an incredibly protected industry in America. Through quotas set on how much every country can export to the US, to price floors that sugar is guaranteed to sell at, to limits on how much each American sugar farmer can grow, the American Sugar Alliance has pushed the powder to be twice as expensive in the US as in the outside world. An average world price of around 18 cents per pound versus about 34 cents in the United States. There are two massive costs to this. One. The literal cost of sugar and anything made with sugar, this whole aisle, is more expensive than what it could be, costing a total of around three to four billion dollars a year in higher food prices. Second, there are tens of thousands of food manufacturing jobs that could be made if sugar prices weren't so high, an estimated 20,000 of them in 2022 versus around 4,000 sugar farming and refining jobs that would be lost from the lower prices. This sugar protection is essentially a mass transfer of billions of dollars from our poor consumers and manufacturers to big sugar so that they can collect their sugar rents and bribe Congress with all of their sugar money. Those conniving, lazy, sweet bastards. But hold on. Did you catch some reasons why there might be basically no protest against these policies? I think there are two reasons in general consumers are not parading in the streets for freer sugar markets. First, they don't care. Up to $4 billion a year is spent by consumers to protect sugar prices. That's a lot of money paid through more expensive food, but there are also 330 million Americans. When you divide that bill out, it comes to only about $12 a person. Over the course of a year, how could you possibly notice that an extra $12 left your bank account? So even though the total population is hurt by sugar quotas, an individual consumer probably doesn't feel it. Whereas for an individual farmer, oh boy, does it make a world of difference in their lives. And the second reason, while job gains would be widespread, job losses would be very concentrated. Sugar beet farmers are clumped together in these parts of the north, and this county in California, and sugar cane farmers needing a very special type of climate are globbed together in Louisiana, Florida, and Texas. If sugar protection were dropped and those 20,000 jobs were created, 
they're likely to be spread across the country. You can pretty much place a Coca-Cola factory anywhere. But if those 4,000 sugar farming jobs are lost, it will destroy these small and geographically dependent communities. So sugar farmers in rural Louisiana lobby to keep that quota like their livelihoods depend on it. And consumers, the ones actually paying for it, well, they don't really seem to notice it at all. Before we get to more examples though, this part of the video was sponsored by BetterHelp. So many things can get in the way of living life to its fullest. Depression, anxiety, stress, you know, things a little more important than paying a little extra for sugar. But here's the thing, just hoping these feelings will go away isn't going to help you. It can actually worsen how you feel in the future. You don't have to struggle alone with these feelings thinking it is part of normal life. Therapy can help to deal with these issues by letting you approach life from a different perspective and BetterHelp wants to give you the tools to do this. BetterHelp is an online platform that will connect you with a licensed therapist trained to listen to you and give you unbiased, helpful advice. You can access it from anywhere on earth, on your phone or computer, and just by answering a few questions, you will be matched to a therapist that best supports your need, usually within 48 hours. From there, you can set up a phone call, video chat, or messaging, whatever you feel most comfortable with, to start talking with them in the easiest possible way for you. It's easy to sign up with the link in the description, betterhelp.com slash hoser, or choose hoser during sign up and you'll get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can try it out and see if it helps you. If you feel like you need feedback for anything holding you back in life, then check it out. So I want to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to something I think is holding everybody back, higher food prices. All around the world, farmers lobby their governments for their own protection and protest when it's taken away. Obviously, though, there are more reasons these are in place than farmers simply lobbying the government and consumers not caring. For example, in many countries, farming families are a form of welfare. You can always go back to the farm if you fail to make it big in the city. Food happens to be a pretty key part of national security. You might want to keep it at home just in case something happens to the outside supply. It could help to alleviate urban-rural inequality, especially in newly urbanized countries. It's just logistically easier to organize a couple thousand geographically concentrated people with a common goal rather than a couple million spread over the country with a rough idea of what they want and the countryside always pops up in nationalist visions. It's pretty easy to play at our hearts and ask for protection when this is the image you show the lawmakers. Still, there are so, so, so many examples of this simple lobbying succeeding. Japan has a 341 yen tariff on every kilogram of imported rice, in part giving them the second highest rice prices on earth. The average Canadian house pays around $400 a year in milk, cheese, and butter to fund our own dairy supply management. South Korea has a tariff rate quota on pretty much all foreign food out there. And for 17 years, Australia had banned Japanese beef imports long after a mad cow disease outbreak spread across the country in 2001. Some of the acrobatics to get around trade restrictions can get pretty creative too. Like when American catfish farmers lobbied to have Vietnamese catfish renamed to Basa to protect their market share, the US government storing billions of pounds of cheese in underground caves from past efforts to prop up its price, Japanese lobbyists trying to ban American beef from entering the country because Japanese digestive systems are different than American ones, and when US lobstermen pushed for a minimum size requirement to be put on lobster imports. That doesn't sound bad, right? It's to prevent overfishing after all, but this law made its very own trade restriction. Canadian lobsters are just naturally smaller than American lobsters because, you know, the water is colder up there. So despite the free trade agreement between the two countries, this restriction costs some Nova Scotian lobstermen tens of millions of dollars by losing access to their largest export market. You won't find the largest system of restrictions and benefits here though. We need to look at Europe, or not them, not them, not them. We need to look at the European Union. The EU is stereotyped for its massive bureaucracy, complicated regulations, and confusing systems. But at least one thing is simple across the block. They can all agree that European farmers need money. 
the Common Agricultural Policy is one of the largest farmer protection programs on earth. It's a system of income and input subsidies and price intervention for nearly all sectors of European agriculture. I mean nearly all, from potatoes to tobacco to honey to flowers to wine to cotton to embryos to biodiesel. In 2019, the CAP spent over 60 billion euros across 13 million farmers, with the bulk of them being in Eastern and Southern European countries. So despite agriculture making up just over 1% of the EU's GDP, agricultural subsidies make up about a third of the union's entire budget. The EU spends about as much on the CAP as it does on energy, defense, administration, the European Social Fund, transportation, buildings, Erasmus, and its Horizon Europe program combined. In fairness to the Europeans though, the CAP was created to have one agricultural policy superimposed onto every EU member rather than have the individual nations decide on their own, which would have almost definitely led to trade wars and nationalist movements inside of the Union. When the EU was forming in the aftermath of the Second World War and the very real chance of a third, the last thing they wanted were trade squabbles between the member states. The CAP had a very real geopolitical purpose, to keep Europe united against the Soviets. But in the 21st century, many from the richer nations see it as them subsidizing both massive corporate farmers and inefficient farms in the south and the east. The average German pays around 170 euros to the fund every year, but the average Romanian? Only around 60 euros, despite them having the most farmers in the EU. And that's just the cost of the subsidies alone, not even including the implicit costs and higher food prices and lost jobs. So does the CAP still serve a purpose today? Yeah, the political project of Europe would be much weaker if Dutch farmers were constantly beefing with German farmers. Many rural communities would be devastated and it keeps European farms regulated and moving toward a common goal. Now, if you think that's a benefit or not, that really depends on your worldview. These farmers don't seem to think regulation helps them all that much. But like all other agricultural protection, it comes at a cost. Europe's cost happens to be unique in that it's not just unevenly shared across income levels, it's unevenly shared across different nations as well. Good luck trying to take it away though, because if you do, you might end up in a situation similar to India's. In 2020, the introduction of three farm acts intending to deregulate agriculture in India sparked not just backlash for farmer protection, but one of the largest protests in human history. Unlike in Europe where farmers' powers are mostly political, Indian farmers have massive social and democratic power. Over 40% of Indians work in agriculture and they make up around a fifth of India's income with just under two thirds of Indians living in a rural area. Farmers are not just a powerful group in parliament, they are the bulk of the population. So these laws in an attempt to make agriculture more profitable would allow farmers to sell directly down the supply chain rather than through a government run market. You know, selling rice directly to food processors or grocers or supermarkets, not always to government bureaucrats. There's exactly the problem. Many farmers did not want to be put at the mercy of corporations. A typical sale of wheat would involve negotiating with a commission agent to get the highest deal possible, then selling it in an auction place to specifically government licensed traders. Even though going through at least three levels of sales before the food reaches your plate is quite inefficient, many farms depend on this sale right here and the stability it guarantees. Supporters of these bills argue that corruption and collusion among licensed government traders forced farmers to accept whatever the so-called Mandi Mafia gives to them, but opponents argue that price floors and minimum support prices are what many farmers depend on to support themselves and their families. Plus, the system has been in place since the 1960s. Why take it away all of a sudden? So instead of tractors blocking the streets of just New Delhi, after these bills were introduced, tractors blocked the streets of nearly every capital and major city in the country. Waves of people showed up to support the farmers. Tens of millions, no, hundreds of millions of people took part. And after a year of these massive protests, the heart and soul and voice of the nation ended up winning. 
Prime Minister Modi isn't one who's really known for compromise, but after a year of insisting to farmers that they would be better off under these new laws, even he had to back down. Farmers just always win. Maybe we can make sense of all of this using imaginary graphs. I know, I know, a lot of people make fun of these incredibly theoretical graphs for simplifying the real world too much, but I think you guys are going to like this one. Okay, it's two axes, one with the amount of profit made on something and the other the marginal cost to produce another of that thing. Along the bottom will be different companies or people or nations of varying efficiencies, with the most efficient down here with the lowest costs. Now we can draw this graph. The more efficient a producer is, the more profit they make. Seems reasonable. Now imagine a change. Any change that both shrinks the production cost and gives them higher profits. It could be through technological progress or free trade or through monopolizing or consolidating an industry. With this change, our graph would shrink like this so that there's one graph before the change and one after. Now we can split it into three sections. These guys, the most efficient producers, would obviously welcome this change. Their profits would be much higher. The middle section seeing lower profits would protest against it. And as for the last section, well, they would be too inefficient in this new world and would go out of business. If we use this imaginary world to think about trade, we should expect the most efficient firms and countries to be the ones pushing for free trade whereas the less efficient guys, say a small farm, to be pushing for protection like their lives depended on it. Maybe it's an entire nation pushing for protection, like what China does with cotton. China is by no means the most efficient producer of cotton on earth. The cost to produce cotton in China is around 20 cents higher per pound than in South Asia and as much as four times higher as some African nations but in part because of its $40 billion subsidies given to its cotton farmers, China is the world's largest cotton producer. These subsidies and a 40% tariff have created much pain for poorer Pakistani or West African farmers whose environments and skill sets are much more geared toward cotton production than Chinese farmers' is, but cannot sell as much to China since they're already covered by their own farmers. Countries in Africa dependent on cotton exports are at most risk with these subsidies, but as the world's largest consumer of cotton, being the largest textile manufacturer, China has the power to shape the cotton market to its will. The cotton protection creates a less efficient, higher cost market, but as a less efficient producer of cotton, that seems to be fine with the Chinese. This is what we saw the Americans doing with sugar as well. They bent the world market to their will by setting a quota on the world's largest sugar market. As a mostly temperate country, the US is clearly not the most efficient producer of a typically tropical good, which is why sugar lobbyists in Brazil have actually pushed for free trade with the Americans, or at least pushed their government to try to negotiate some sort of deal to expand their quota. America's cost of producing a kilogram of sugar is around 40 cents, while Brazil's is only 14 cents. Brazil has both the right climate and built up infrastructure, skills, and wages to make sugar cheaper than the Americans can. Pushing for free trade would help the Brazilian sugar industry, but as a, let's say, pretty major player in the sugar game, the Americans have the upper hand here. They're the ones who get to shape our graph. And then, worst of all, we have those out here, when change actually puts you out of business. Even though many Haitians don't have access to the recommended caloric intake every day, they usually get the bulk of their calories through rice. As the nation suffered decades of fighting, mismanagement, and environmental degradation, Haiti lagged behind economically, including in its rice production. While Haiti was self-sufficient in rice for many decades, it was incredibly inefficient with most people working in subsistence agriculture on small farms for their families or immediate communities. During the 80s and 90s though, the US, IMF, and the World Bank tried desperately to push for free trade around the world. It started with them sending food aid to Haiti in the 80s, that's commendable and then through debt restructuring deals pushed for Haiti to reduce its rice import tariffs from 35% to 3%. 
and by 1995, all import and export licenses were removed. Haiti had adopted the freest trade policies in the Caribbean. They just did not have the goods to back that trade up. How can these small Haitian farmers compete against giant American rice farmers with easy access to these fields, cutting edge technology, healthy financial markets, and of course, US government subsidies? As cheap Miami rice flooded Haiti, domestic rice production crashed. From 1985 to 1995, the amount of rice they farmed had halved, yet the rice they imported grew by 25 times. Even in 2020, Haiti only grew 75,000 megatons of rice, much below their 1990s average of around 125,000. There's just no incentive to grow rice when American rice undercuts almost everyone in the country. Economic theory says that when a change like this happens, most people will just switch to whatever they're more efficient at with these lower prices. But as a poor population with little mobility to switch into a different career and a literacy rate of around 60%, you just have to ask, switch into what? So despite the trade openness and cheap rice, Haiti remains the least developed nation in the Americas. Hopping quickly over to the mainland, while free trade with the US is estimated to have created over 5 million jobs in Mexico, it also took away around 1.3 million farming jobs, mainly in corn. And among these job losses, it was small self-employed farmers who were hit the hardest. While those employed by large farms saw pay stagnation in the decade after NAFTA, self-employed farmer income, aka smaller farmers, fell by almost 90%. It was the least efficient small guys that went out of business with these changes. It's them who push for protection. Besides them though, most people are worse off when food prices are higher. I mean, duh, food is something everyone needs every single day. And some staple foods are eaten by everybody in the country at roughly the same levels. So with these hidden costs, it's an inherently regressive tax. Higher food prices hurt those with lower incomes harder. And with the current round of the World Trade Organization's negotiations paused since 2008, it's not likely they're going to do anything to free up the food trade. So why don't consumers? You know, you and me. Yeah, let's go on the street and protest for cheaper milk. Well, like I said before, these are fairly small costs that you don't immediately see leaving your wallet. They might show up in a brick of cheese costing $10.48 instead of $8.48, but to the relatively small class of farmers in the modern world, this small extra cost is absolutely worth organizing and fighting for. In the US where the average farmer income is a good bit higher than the national average, it's pretty clear that protection like income support and quotas helps farmers quite a lot. Once these are in place though, it's just easy to keep in place. And the longer it lasts, the more damaging it is to take it away. As India clearly showed when it tried to take away 60 year old protections back in 2020. Plus, hey, the government doesn't always want to get rid of easy revenue sources by cutting some of their tariffs. Maybe when food used to cost a quarter of an average income, there was much more unrest against these laws. One of the only concentrated efforts against a specific agricultural protection on specific types of food was the Anti-Corn Law League, a British worker-led middle-class movement to repeal trade restrictions on grain imports succeeding in 1846. That's a long time ago. But this was also at a time when the United Kingdom was going through a never before seen urbanization effort and factory workers needed access to cheap bread to survive in the new cities. Today though, the average Brit spends only around 7-8% to of their income on food and I'll take the bet that we won't see any concentrated effort against food restrictions in the UK anytime soon. Are we too rich nowadays to even care about our inflated food prices? Or are farmers just better at the political game than almost any other group is?